So we're back. It's 2024 and the first sorta AAA release of this year is Prince of Persia The Lost Crown. Now given we've just ended a year of top tier games with huge budgets and long development cycles, I suspect this one's gonna slip under the radar for most people. I mean despite Prince of Persia being a beloved franchise to many, the last entry came out a whopping 14 years ago. It's no doubt still a household name, but one that's faded into obscurity with the sands of time. <laughs> but yeah, it was always going to be a difficult task for Ubisoft to resurrect this IP and capture the hearts of a modern gaming audience. Luckily, Ubisoft had found an angle. They announced Prince of Persia The Lost Crown with a trailer that showed a sort of return to the old formula as a side-scrolling Metroidvania, but appealing to the modern crowd with a slick 3D slash 2D visual style that is so hot right now. And I thought this looked sick. Suffice to say, I was exactly exactly Ubisoft's target audience here, I was immediately on board, despite being someone who wouldn't have cared less about the prospect of a new Prince of Persia game. Having now finished it after 20 plus hours, I am pleased to report that Prince of Persia The Lost Crown is in fact a very good game. It's a well-crafted metroidvania with a vast interconnected world, rich with secrets, creative puzzles and platforming challenges that require mastery over an array of movement tools and unique time-bending abilities. It boasts a plethora of accessibility options and quality of life features to alleviate hesitations some may have with the genre, but also to manage the game's difficulty, particularly when it comes to combat. And that's where this game really excels. Combat is fast, flashy, and its mechanical depth presents a level of skill expression rarely seen in this genre. It's an endlessly engaging framework, elevated by the game's impressive suite of enemy types and gruelling boss fights that are both well-designed and spectacular to behold. This, combined with the game's setting and visual style, also allow this to carve its own identity, one that is still unique Prince of Persia while also providing some overdue reinvigoration. The platforming can be a little frustrating at times and the story doesn't quite explore its characters to the extent that I was hoping for, but as a metroidvania this certainly ranks among the best. If you're into this genre, this is an excellent offering deserving of all the critical acclaim it's already received and it heralds a triumphant return for the Prince of Persia franchise. The setup for this story is simple. You are Sargon, a member of a super-powered team of heroes known as the Immortals, tasked with defending Persia from foreign invaders. On the night of a victory celebration, the actual Prince of Persia gets kidnapped, so of course it's up to you and the gang to go after him. Your journey takes a peculiar turn when you arrive on Mount Kaf. Time appears to be broken here, it flows unpredictably. Hours for some are weeks or years to others. Time is so so mangled that one may even run into other versions of themselves. The team agrees to divide and conquer and so it's up to you as Sargon to navigate the time shattered halls of Mount Kaf in order to save the prince. Now that's a pretty captivating premise for a story, right? Like the first few hours of this game start really strong in my opinion. A string of mysteries, twists and betrayals, uh, you're constantly running into members of the immortals as well as new NPCs while slowly piecing together what the deep is with Mount Kaf. Unfortunately, after those opening hours, I found the story the weakest part of this package as it didn't do nearly enough to explore these interesting characters and plot threads. Outside of those first few hours of the game, uh, Sargon kind of lacks any real personality to latch onto. The characters imply early on that he's sort of a cocky hothead, not totally in control of his emotions, always seeking the next battle, but then it's never really discussed again as that anger of his isn't present in any future interactions. To my surprise, he's kind of just a chill dude, immediately on good terms with everyone he meets. Nothing wrong with that by the way, but I found some major story beats ended up falling a little flat as they hinge on an internal struggle that isn't really there. There are some vague hints at it, particularly when characters mention other unsavory versions of Sargon that they've run into.
too. In fact, he himself meets them a couple times. These would have been perfect occasions to explore this inner conflict, allowing for some very literal self-reflection, but nothing is done with them. There's very little discussion on Sargon's character, much less any kind of personal growth. I think a key reason for this is that the supporting characters just aren't very present. You get the sense in the opening act that the Immortals are kind of like the Avengers. They work great together on the field, they're fighting alongside you while riffing off a healthy mix of friendly bants or minor squabbles. I found them all quite charming. I was keen to learn more about them, their relationships with one another. Again, Unfortunately, you just don't get much of that at all outside of the odd lore collectible. You never really see them interact with one another again, and in the fleeting moments you bump into them, they don't have anything meaningful to say about themselves or the other immortals. There just isn't enough here to flesh out these characters, to get invested, and it resulted in me feeling rather emotionally distant to all the events unfolding. Don't get me wrong, I think the story is entertaining enough, especially in the way it's delivered. Voice acting is decent, uh, there are some major twists and revelations that did catch me off guard. Cutscenes are so fun to watch, with all the bombastic fight choreography of an anime, I mean, the way it's shot, the way it's animated, the story is grand in its execution. It just didn't emotionally resonate with me because of the lack of character work. Metroidvanias typically don't focus much on story in the traditional sense. They tend to rely more on mystery and world building through minimal exchanges. Character interactions are often sparse, sometimes not even voice acted. So I just think it's a missed opportunity that with this strong a setup, this cast of characters and this very talented cinematics team that Ubisoft weren't able to deliver on that uniquely narrative focused experience that this genre is missing. The good news is that my gripes kinda end there because while I found the story a bit disappointing, the rest of this package absolutely rules. The first thing that clicked with me when booting up the Lost Crown was just how great it feels to control Sargon. His movements are snappy, he can slide which breaks into a sprint, he can bound between walls with speed, and your traversal capabilities are expanded immensely as you progress the story, later unlocking a dash, double jump and grapple. For the most part, the Lost Crown doesn't reinvent the wheel here, but it does do those Metroidvania things very well. You'll explore the vast interconnected world of Mount Calf, gaining access to new pockets as you unlock abilities and opening shortcuts along the way. There's a variety of locales here, between the ornate halls, the light-starved underbelly, an ancient, lush forest and many more. It's worth shouting out the visuals, I mean Ubisoft have landed on this clean, stylized look, often associated with Riot's games. If you know me, you know this is absolutely my jam. I love how much the colours pop, how readable it is. The environment art here is fantastic. Each of Mount Calf's locations have such distinct visual identity. A standout for me was this naval battle frozen in time amidst a tempest. You can walk on the water, see the curling waves at a standstill, hop between flying pieces of debris and navigate half-destroyed ship interiors. It's almost always worth going off the beaten path too. Uh, there's a lot to discover here, from hidden bosses, chests behind fake walls, NPCs with short side quests, and strange puzzles with little explanation. And these all offer meaningful rewards, like rare currencies or charms which you can equip to tailor your build and playstyle. You'll come across platforming sections, which are all some variation of timing jumps while avoiding hazards, and you'll need to do this with haste as most platforms give way after a short time, some almost immediately. As I said, it's more or less what you'd come to expect from a metroidvania, but these challenges are a joy to overcome, just by virtue of how responsive Sargon's movement is. It's a whole other thing though when the platforming leans more on the puzzle elements. These were a real highlight for me. So eventually you'll unlock the game's core unique mechanic, being able to freeze a moment of yourself in time and rewind yourself back to that position at will. The puzzles from that point on really take advantage advantage of this. You'll use it to step on a trap to trigger it and then rewind back to safety and use that trap as a platform. You'll also use levers or pressure plates to move walls and then bounce between
between them and then set your position mid-jump and rewind back once you've pulled a different lever. There was one particular section that involved me recording like multiple versions of myself and then timing their actions such that the real me could get to the end of the puzzle. It sounds complicated and yeah, I mean, it had me really racking my brain. There's a couple more puzzle solving abilities you unlock and while the golden path rarely demands that you use all these tools in conjunction, they can still be quite challenging. Metroidvanias tend to be like this. You can often get stuck on a puzzle, a platforming section, or you might even just get confused about where to go next. Fortunately, there are some great quality of life features here to alleviate those frustrations. For example, there's an option in the settings that opens portals for you to basically skip any puzzle or platforming segments should you choose. The game has an exploration and guided mode, which you can switch between at any time. And for that full sense of discovery, you can keep it locked to exploration, but guided mode will literally indicate on your map where your next objective is. And even where sections are closed off or open to you based on your ability. There's this NPC that offers maps to completely reveal zones, and you can also purchase hints from her at the main camp, where she'll clue you in on the most direct routes to get to that next location. Found a chest that you can't get to yet, or a puzzle that you can't solve? Well, you can take a literal snapshot of that location that gets pinned to the map, so you know exactly where to circle back to. I've become lost in Metroidvanias on many occasions, to the point where I've almost dropped them completely and could only break through once I found a good guide. So it's just great to see these additions here. It made for a very pleasant experience and I hope to see this sort of thing get carried forward where appropriate. There's an argument to be made for preserving a game's intended difficulty, but I think in this case it serves well to maximize player enjoyment and makes this an approachable title for anyone, no matter their experience with the genre. Finally, let's talk about the combat, which really is the Lost Crown's shining jewel. I've already spoken about the array of traversal tools and how they're useful for platforming and puzzles, but they're equally crucial here as you'll use them to close distance and evade attacks. Your arsenal is simple but can be utilized in multiple ways. You've got your trusty dual swords with directional inputs for various moves, a bow for sniping out of reach enemies or maintaining a combo, and it can also transform into a bouncing chakram. You'll immediately notice that the combat here feels notably different than other Metroidvanias. It channels games like Super Smash Bros. or Devil May Cry, as you find openings to land charged heavy attacks and chain combos to juggle enemies in the air, preventing them from ever making their own attacks. Rewarding your aggression and poise is the Athra meter, which you can use to dump some hard-hitting spells. It's charged up by dealing damage, but most notably through parrying. A perfectly timed parry against an enemy's major attack will perform an execution, whipping the camera in for a sick animation and huge damage. Holding all these tools in your mind, weaving them together while paying close attention to enemy telegraphs, it's a lot to manage, but very rewarding to contend with. And the way that the game frames those abilities, the executions, the fantastic sound design and VFX, creates such a satisfying combat framework that even battles against a bunch of common lackeys can feel tense and exciting. On that note, the enemy variety here is impressive as well. Each zone has like half a dozen enemy types, each with unique attack patterns that you'll need to learn and exploit. A lot of these enemies have the same capabilities that you do. They're able to dodge and even parry your attacks if you're getting too hasty. So it's already a deep, satisfying gameplay loop from the jump. But again, once you're introduced to that time rewind mechanic, it becomes a whole different ball game where you can rewind back to an already charged heavy attack to double it up or use it to maximize airtime. Uh, there's just so many possibilities. I'm probably not doing it justice in the gameplay. I don't think I ever fully realized the potential of this combat system, but I have no doubt that the sunny legends of the world can pull off some insane plays with it. I mean, I've got to say, I think this is my favorite combat system 
out of any Metroidvania so far. The amount of combos you can perform by stringing together directional attacks, your traversal abilities, your Athra abilities, and abusing the time rewind mechanic, the skill expression afforded to you here is, I think, unparalleled in this genre. And that's to say nothing of the boss fights. Oh man, I mean, so there's not too many of these boss fights in the game, maybe just over half a dozen with the exception of some secret and minor bosses, but man, are they an event. They're blazing fast, constantly dishing out moves with very little downtime. While I didn't take advantage of my full arsenal in general combat, here, you really don't have a choice. They will demand you use everything you've got, including that time rewinding to warp through attack or quickly get to opposite sides of the arena. The mechanics are all well telegraphed, and I think the art style makes these fights easy to pass, despite being so visually over the top. They too have special attacks that you can perfect parry for a flashy animation and a much needed knockdown. But because these aren't just scripted events, you really need to earn those hero moments. And it made mastering these encounters so rewarding. And master them you must, because these bosses are hard. And I was playing on the normal mode. The first few weren't too bad at all, but about halfway through, you're really expected to be keeping up with weapon, charm, and health upgrades by exploring, so the difficulty does ramp up quite a bit. Can't really complain about the difficulty tuning though, because you can basically tune it yourself. Like the exploration, there's a bunch of accessibility options here, like multiple difficulty settings, uh, you can tweak damage output and input, parry windows. There's an impressive suite of options to tailor your experience and I very much appreciated that. Oh, and the music, uh, just phenomenal. Gareth Coker, the mastermind behind the Ori soundtracks, uh, Halo Infinite, Darksiders, this guy does not miss. Uh, needless to say, it isn't the hip hop you heard in the trailers. He collaborated here with an artist known as Mentrix to produce a soundtrack that's a blend of modern rock, orchestra, and Iranian instrumentation. It reminds me a lot of the Hades soundtrack and how that combined Mediterranean instruments with contemporary sounds. It totally elevates the boss fights and cinematics while still sounding distinctly Prince of Persia. Never failed to get my blood pumping when sweating my ass off during the final moments of a showdown. It's rare that a game manages to flip the narrative after such a seemingly poor initial reception to its announcement. It's clear the majority here were not particularly keen on this drastic shift for the Prince of Persia brand. I'm sure some still aren't on board, holding out hope for a more true to form third person title that focuses on the Prince himself. I mean, there is that remake coming, but um, yeah, I don't know about that one. I, for one, am totally down for what Ubisoft have cooked here, and I hope they continue along this path for the series. The story was a bit of a letdown for me, especially given how it could have delivered what this genre is kind of missing right now, but I think the rest of the package makes up for it. What I said in the preview remains true. This game just oozes style from top to bottom in its vibrant art, its dazzling cinematics, its combat depth, its epic soundtrack. This carefully constructed world of Mount Calf is ripe for exploration with so much to discover despite appearing as a sort of smaller title. The game ran me about 20 hours on normal difficulty with a bit of meandering, but I'd expect easily over 30 hours here if you properly take your time. Prince of Persia The Lost Crown has started 2024 with a bang. It's a high quality metroidvania that builds some new ideas to this genre's already compelling formula while successfully modernizing the Prince of Persia IP and appealing to a new generation. A generation that I am a part of. I mean, it has made me pay attention to the Prince of Persia IP, and I'm now genuinely looking forward to what comes next for this series in the same way that I look forward to the next Ori or Hollow Knight. It's available now on all current gen and last gen consoles, and I strongly recommend it. <laughs>